All right. Uh, thank you very much for having me here today. Uh, we're going to keep it to the basics and uh, feel free to fire away any questions. Uh, uh, this, this PowerPoint presentation is a mixture of some of the advanced stuff that we do with uh, when we discuss the care amongst the cardiology groups. Uh, a lot of it is geared towards the uh, general public to help them raise awareness for uh, cardiovascular care. February is the American Heart Month, so also Valentine's Day, so it kind of goes hand in hand. Uh, with that, I'm going to start uh, the talk. So the primary objective is to understand the prevention efforts and implementing prevention strategies to understand the ASCVD risk calculation. ASCVD, atherosclerotic cardiovascular disease. It means basically how the plaque builds up, what are the causes of it, uh, how do we minimize the risk factors for development of blockages or plaques or cholesterol or hardening of the arteries in general population. Again, as most of you know that cardiovascular disease is uh, still today the number one cause of uh, morbidity, death rate and, uh, and hospitalization in the United States, again. It's the number one cause in all developing uh, developed countries. So we still have a long way to go. We have come a long way in uh, improving the quality of life and uh, uh, improving symptoms, minimizing hospitalization, uh, but we have a long way to go. So again, uh, we'll start with uh, some basic guidelines and gonna keep it very simple to the basic risk factors and how do we modify them or minimize them? Uh, some of the things that we're going to hit on today is uh, what do we do with aspirin with this new day and age? Oh, I heard it on the radio that aspirin is no good for you. Is it true for me? That some of the questions will be answered today. What is a good blood pressure? My pressure is always high when I see the doctor in, doctor in the office but it's always great. I don't have any symptoms for high blood pressure. Again, we'll address some of those things. How low is your good cholesterol? How high is your bad cholesterol? Is cholesterol good for you, bad for you? What happens when I eat a hamburger or a fatty meal? So that's another one we'll discuss today. The next one should be a no-brainer, cigarettes. Absolutely not, absolutely not. Uh, the next one is uh, diabetes and diet, which kind of goes hand in hand with the monitoring of your cholesterol and stuff. And the extremely important diet, exercise, and we'll talk to a certain extent about genetics. All right, on to the next slide. Again, to make it easy, it's called A, B, C, D, and E of primary prevention. Primary prevention being the key word primary, before the before event happens. So I kind of make it very simple and compare it to a speeding ticket. Uh, if you have a speeding ticket on your record, then it's a secondary prevention. You want to minimize the chance of getting a second ticket. But if you follow the rules and regulations, obey the laws, then your primary prevention kicks into play, meaning your chance of getting the first speeding ticket is low. So with that being said, uh, aspirin, low dose aspirin for primary prevention. The ball game is changing with aspirin and it is kind of moving towards uh, aspirin being used for selective high risk individuals. Who are those? We will talk about it in a few minutes. Uh, blood pressure management with B, uh, maintain blood pressure less than 130 over 80. C is for cholesterol, also for cigarettes. There are different ways. If you have the habit of nicotine, which is one of the worst addictions in the world, there are different modalities out there to help you uh, kick this habit. D is for diet and weight loss. D also stands for diabetes. A lot of new medications, probably one or two a month coming through on the diabetes pipeline. A lot of them are playing a very, very key role in mitigating the cardiovascular risk factors and improving the uh, hospitalization and death rate in cardiac patients. 
an exercise. What is a good exercise regimen? How much exercise should I be doing? Oh, I walk around all day at work, at home. Is that enough? We will answer that. All right, so basically some of the basic risk factors we're gonna talk about. Uh, this is from the physician perspective. If you're a healthy individual in the age range of 20 to 39, we can assess the traditional risk factors, whether you have a family history, do you have a high blood pressure, cholesterol issue, all those things come into play and we can revisit and assess them every four to five years, give or take. Once you cross this golden age of 40, then all things change and we need to be, we need to start taking better care of ourselves. You know, we need to start focusing on ourselves so that we can have a good, healthy life for a long time. So those are some of the things that we go by, uh, risk factors that we have a 10 year estimate and we need to assess them every uh, year or two. Again, some of the high risk individuals which we start going into are highlighted on the right side of the screen. Someone who has a family history of premature, premature heart disease. Again, if you're 50 and someone in your family, especially the first degree relatives or even second degree relatives, you know, have a history of heart disease. My dad had a heart attack at 40. My so-and-so had a heart attack and had a stroke at 40. All those things come into play. Primary hypercholesterolemia, elevated cholesterol. Uh, without, so some people have genetic uh, defects or genetic predisposition, I should say, which leads to having them have high cholesterol from the onset. Now, nowadays, the American College of Cardiology, American Heart Association are even recommending once the kids reach certain age group, you know, teenagers have your cholesterol checked once because you never know, you may have a genetic predisposition, meaning genetically being prone to have high cholesterol. For those people, we should get ahead of the ball game. I have a bunch of young people in my office who come in with super, super high cholesterol and they are in the high risk category. Uh, chronic kidney disease. If your kidney number is not normal, metabolic syndrome, you know, if you have sleep apnea, obesity, uh, certain conditions in women, preeclampsia, premature menopause, chronic inflammation, you know, all the rheumatoid arthritis, psoriatic arthritis. Fortunately, the general osteoarthritis, the bony arthritis is not part of this. It's primarily something that is a chronic inflammation, lupus. Those are the conditions that kind of predispose you to having a higher risk than normal population of having heart disease. Ethnicity, South Asian ancestry, people from India, Pakistan, Bangladesh, Sri Lanka, all the Southeast Asian countries, they have a very high predisposition for having blockages at an early age and life ending or life altering events happen. Again, persistently high triglycerides, CRP level, this goes hand in hand with an inflammatory biomarker, chronic inflammation, LP little a, APO1, and this ankle brachial index is basically a measure of how the blood flow is in your lower extremities, in your legs, the, uh, what is commonly known as poor circulation. If your ankle brachial index is less than 0.9, then it puts you at an elevated risk of having cardiovascular concerns or problems. Moving on, uh, you might have heard about this. This is coming into uh, more of a limelight of the late. It's a coronary calcium score. It's a 10,000 foot view, a quick CAT scan, whose radiation is less than that of a mammogram to see if you have early calcium deposits in your coronary arteries, for simplicity, in your plumbing system of the heart. If you have any early calcium deposit, because it's, it's a marker that we need to up the ante and start minimizing or mitigating the risk factors. So again, you, uh, a lot of places uh, um, I've come across, mo mobile units are also offering this 
on an outside basis. You can get it from your primary care doctor to see if uh, you can get a calcium score if you have risk factors. Again, coronary calcium, coronary artery calcium score, if it's greater than or uh, equal to 100 Agustin units or greater than or equal to 75th percentile of your age race, then you are at an elevated risk. What do we do? We need to start working on minimizing your risk factors. Again, going back to your previous slide, the risk factors, cholesterol, diabetes, exercise, blood pressure, sugar control, all those things. If your score is zero, then you're in a good shape. Again, all those things come into play. The most important thing, if you have classic risk factors, the absence of calcium does not rule out that you don't have calcified plaque. Plaque, hardening of the arteries or cholesterol buildup. Initial stages, it's on the softer side. It does not have calcification in it. So it does not show up on the calcium score. But if it does show up on the calcium score, that means that you need to start working on mod modifying the risk factors. So extremely important to keep it in mind. Okay, let's take the uh, uh, head on for this uh, aspirin thing. So very, very frequently am I asked in the office, oh, I don't have, uh, what do I do with aspirin? So it's, it's very clear that what used to be considered once as the holy grail of cardiac medicine is starting to be looked at again. And really people are digging into it to see whether you really need aspirin or not. So the bottom line is, if you are age 70 years of or more, again, 70 or more without any risk factors, without any risk factors, meaning you never, you're not, have high blood pressure, you do not have diabetes, no family history, no kidney issues, no stroke, no heart stents, none of that. Perfectly healthy, not taking any medications and you made it to 70, you should not be on aspirin. Because at that point going forward, the risk of bleeding is higher than the benefit. Again, age 70 or more, no risk factors, then you should not be started on aspirin. If you've been on aspirin before that, then you should continue that. Again, if you have calcium score, diabetes, high blood pressure, high cholesterol, chronic kidney issues, history of a stroke, history of stent in the heart, history of heart surgery or bypass surgery, you need to be on aspirin. This is for a select group of patients who are more than 70 years of age, without any risk factors, they should not be started on aspirin. Again, blood pressure guidelines, another hitting low hanging fruit. This is a very good number. The number to remember is about 120 over 80, roughly 120 over 80 is what your blood pressure should be. So I, again, I get calls in the office. Uh, people ask me, oh, my blood pressure is 100 over 70. Is it too low? If you don't have any risk factors and if you're not dizzy, that's fine. You probably have had that blood pressure all your lifetime. So there is no such thing as too low blood pressure in the absence of symptoms. Again, symptoms being the key thing, meaning dizziness, passing out, you know, palpitations, anything out of the ordinary. What is normal for you is normal for you. If, if you deviate from the normal, then your pressure of 70 on the bottom number is low for you. Again, most of the time, it's a question of high blood pressure. So 120 over 80 is the golden number to keep in mind. Why did, we, why did the American College of Cardiology and American Heart Association change this? Because they found that the higher the blood pressure, the higher your death rate, higher your rate of stroke, and higher rates of hospitalization. So to minimize this in, in the right patient population, we need to be more aggressive in controlling your blood pressure. Again, more mortality, death rates attributed to hypertension in rising. This is as late as 2020, the higher the blood pressure, the higher the death rate. There is nothing new about this. So 
Again, this is a good summary slide to kind of get an idea as to what needs to be done and how to tackle this issue. All right, so normal blood pressure on the left is promote optimal lifestyle habits, you know, good exercise regimen, watching, watching your diet. In terms of diet, salt intake is the number one culprit. I don't eat any additional salt. I don't put any salt on my food, none of that. But there is a ton of hidden salt in the canned goods. So if you want to really look at your salt intake, turn on the back where the label says the sodium percentage. Uh, it comes to a uh, surprise to a lot of people that the total amount of salt a human body needs in one day, in one day is one and a quarter teaspoon, not a tablespoon, teaspoon. And that includes all the hidden salts amongst all the fruits, vegetables, canned goods, everything you eat, drink, all that stuff. A lot of people are very sensitive to salt and they will have leg swelling if they eat a bunch of salty food, a bag of potato chips. Salt and vinegar, there you go. Next day you're gonna have leg swelling. That's the reason for it. Elevated blood pressure, anything in this range, you start to modify the risk factors while you can. Watch your diet. If you start having more high blood pressure, estimated risk, then we start talking about medications. And then if it's more than 140 or 90, you need to be on medications. Another common question I hear in my office visit is, Oh, doc, uh, I don't know my blood pressure is high. I don't have any symptoms. Blood pressure, high blood pressure is the number one silent killer. It will not tell you, it will not demonstrate any symptoms. Few people are symptomatic. A lot of people are not symptomatic. And their pressure in the office is 160 over 110. So we need to start working on that. All right, again, back to the, I'm gonna skip a couple of slides and talk about uh, okay, let's go to the exercise. Sorry, let's go to cholesterol. Cholesterol numbers, what's a high cholesterol number? Again, diabetes is a heart disease equivalent. Again, if you have diabetes, you are in the same category as the person who has had a heart disease. So the important thing for people with diabetes, stroke, any stents in the heart, stents in the legs, any um, chronic kidney problems, you need to reduce your LDL cholesterol as much as possible. Especially with people with heart disease and diabetes, that number should be less than 70, 70. And again, as uh, from what I'm hearing is the American College of Cardiology is leaning towards decreasing it even more. It has been well known and well shown in multiple trials in patients in thousands of patients that the lower your LDL, the lesser your chances of having life altering, life ending cardiac events. So be very careful with that. In young adults, if your LDL is greater than 190, we should start looking at it as a strong likelihood of having family history, familial hypercholesterolemia. All those things going to come into play. The slide for digression, who said smoking kills on 48? still looking good and feeling good. So uh, nicotine replacement therapy, plenty of options out there. I would strongly recommend you talking to your primary care physician about some or all or most of them. There is no known benefit to smoking. Let me put it simply. There is no known benefit to smoking. Um, weight and diet. Again, weight loss is an extremely important thing uh, not being underweight, but if you are optimal weight. So you can look it up anywhere on Google. So what is my optimal weight? The BMI or body mass index is where it will tell you. We have noted quite a bit that as you lose the weight, there is a huge reduction in other risk factors, meaning your blood pressure will improve. Your cholesterol number will improve. You will feel better less sleepiness, you know, less daytime somnolence. All these things are important and they, your the blood sugars improve quite a bit once your weight starts coming down. So important thing to keep in mind. Cholesterol rich foods, are they good or bad? Again, 
Every other day there's a newspaper article. How many eggs can I eat? How many this thing can I eat? Is coffee good for you, bad for you? As all our parents have told us for up teen times, everything in moderation is okay. Again, not eating a dozen eggs a day. One egg a day for adults is good. A cup of coffee a day, if you really like it, I'll raise my hand on the culprit, then it's worthwhile drinking it in the morning. That should not be the 7 11 44 ounce big gulp. That cannot be the coffee. Diet soda, stay away from that. They have a lot of hidden chemicals that we don't even know about. Best thing to drink, God's nature, natural water. So drink water, about 64 ounces a day, at least if you don't have any other cardiac problems. So again, diabetes. Diabetes is of paramount importance. Diabetes is up there in playing a major, major, major role in uh, contributing to heart disease as the number one killer in the United States. So I can't emphasize it enough. Talk to your regular doctor, talk to your diabetes doctor, get that hemoglobin A1C under control. Six, 6.5, that's an optimal control. Again, weight loss goes a long way and lots of different medications out in the market now to help you uh, attain the goal. Exercise, another thing, as I hinted earlier, oh, I walk around all day. No, that's not exercise, that is not exercise. Exercise means maintaining your heart rate to a certain level. And again, I'm going to highlight it here, 150 minutes a week of moderate intensity aerobic activity or 75 minutes a week of vigorous intensity. So again, 30 minutes a day, five times a week, 150 minutes. If you can't do anything else, just good old walking. Focus only on walking, not what walking at work. That doesn't work that does not maintain your heart rate to higher levels. Because at work, even though we're busy going back and forth, what we end up doing is we, are taking a, we end up taking a break. So our heart rate is not continuously elevated. So this is extremely important. And again, back to the conclusion, aspirin, we answered that question 70 years or more. If you don't have any risk factors, never been on aspirin, don't start aspirin. Blood pressure 120 or 80, Cholesterol, get your cholesterol checked, get it under control. Cigarettes, multiple ways to quit smoking. And here's my classic joke. If you guys quit smoking, save $10 a day. Call me anytime, I'll come and pick it up at the end of the year, about $3,600 a year, I'll take it. So control your diabetes, watch your diet, exercise 150 minutes. Follow up with your doctors and please, 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 take the right medications. And if you have any confusion, concern, do not stop the medications without talking to your doctors. Please talk to them without stopping these medications. These are good medications. They're, uh, you're taking them for the right cause. Stopping them prematurely can lead to a lot of problems. I did have another uh, little bit of uh, presentation, but I think this will help much more in terms of uh, understanding with the general population. So I'm going to stop sharing the screen. Terrific. And Thank you, Dr. Desai. That was very informative. Uh, very much appreciate it. Please hold your questions until after Dr. Soberman's presentation. Okay. Thank you. And Dr. Soberman, can we have you turn your video on so we can actually see you um, as you're presenting? Okay. Can you hear me? I certainly can. Yes. Wonderful. Well, thank you for inviting me to join in on this conversation this evening. And I want to thank Dr. Harry Desai to, for his very, very educational uh, talk. I learned a lot. And uh, after this talk, I'm planning to walk 30 minutes tonight. So thank you, Dr. Desai, for your very important advice on preventing uh, the number one killer in America, which is coronary artery disease. My task tonight is a little different. I'm going to be talking uh, to all of you tonight about a topic that is also very, unfortunately, very common, and that is atrial fibrillation. Atrial fibrillation is the most common heart rhythm disturbance that is um, seen uh, in both in America and worldwide and is a major contributor to both um, symptoms uh, and also unfortunately strokes and which can also lead to death. Um, I um, work with two other uh, 
phenomenal physicians, Dr. Scott Burke and Dr. Michael Rosengarten, and the three of us uh, are part of the Capital Health Medical Group uh, Cardiac Electrophysiology section. Uh, atrial fibrillation is a very complex topic, and I only have 30 minutes to discuss it tonight. Uh, so I would recommend that if, uh, if there are other questions uh, that I don't answer tonight, you can uh, please post them on the chat site or speak to your cardiologist uh, about that. Uh, if you have a cardiologist or your primary physician, um, or you can always um, come to one of our offices and see one of the three uh, electrophysiologists at Capital Health Medical Group. Atrial fibrillation is a disorder of the upper chambers of the heart, uh, which cause uh, electrical short circuits and irregular uh, rapid heartbeats in the upper chambers of the heart, otherwise referred to as fibrillation. It is diagnosed by ECG, the electrocardiogram. And the uh, ECG is classically um, uh, um, an irregularly irregular uh, EKG where the heartbeats are rapid at times and slow at other times. In between the heartbeats, we see little waveforms that are chaotic and don't, are ir uh, inconsistent from beat to beat, representing the various little uh, electrical short circuits uh, in the upper chambers of the heart between the main the large spikes, which represent the conduction in the lower chambers. In old days, uh, when I was in training, uh, in my uh, training years, um, uh, 30 years ago, 25 years ago, uh, most of these uh, diagnoses were made in the hospital setting or in the clinic uh, based on a conventional 12-lead electrocardiogram. But over the years, uh, we have perfected uh, much of our EKG technology so that we have now wearable technologies where e atrial fibrillation can be diagnosed uh, not on a spot EKG, uh, but rather on with ambulatory long-term monitoring, either a 24-hour Holter monitor um, or a um, handheld uh, event monitor that a patient can uh, self-activate. Uh, there's also implantable uh, monitors that can be inserted under the skin called uh, implantable cardiac monitors, which can speak to a, a wireless transmitter through uh, uh, Bluetooth technology and can be accessed on cloud-based uh, systems to the doctor's office. And these uh, mo uh, transmitters uh, that are implanted under the skin can last up to four or five years. Uh, which is much longer duration monitoring than the conventional uh, wearable technologies uh, that we, I show above. There's also it can, uh, built in pacemakers and defibrillators for those patients who have uh, indwelling pacemakers and defibrillators, atrial fibrillation detection technology built into those as well. So we've gone uh, a long way from the, uh, in more recent years, from the conventional uh, uh, event monitoring uh, that with uh, sticky electrodes on the skin to now a single electrode monitoring on the skin, much easier for the patients to wear uh, and much uh, less um, noticeable under uh, the garments. And now, today, we have even more exciting uh, monitoring systems using um, through, um, uh, iPhones and Samsung uh, phones um, that can be um, accessed and very are FDA approved as medical devices. Uh, class two uh, indication uh, reg, uh, uh, labeling, uh, which means it's medical grade technology that can be um, promote pr produce ECGs, much like what I'm showing here, which is as, just as good as any of our other technologies in detecting and diagnosing atrial fibrillation um, whenever the patient is wearing their uh, wristwatch. Also, there's a company named Cardia, uh, which is uh, also an FDA designated class two medical device, which can um, connect with your smartphone and allow with a, a touch of a, a mere, mere touch of a few fingers, uh, it make, can get a, a 30 second EKG and um, prov show, uh, can show e uh, atrial fibrillation when it occurs. Of course, this requires the patient to uh, take the cardia and put their fingers on so it's not as um, continuous as wearing a, wrist, a wristband watch or a Fitbit or an iPhone-like uh, device. Uh, this, uh, there's, much, there's much data in the, in the cardiology literature on these wearable devices, um, as re and there was a large review article in, in the Journal of American Cardiology a couple years ago, uh, basically um, pr uh, showing through data and statistics that these uh, detection devices allow for earlier detection of atrial fibrillation than would otherwise be obtained 
which can lead to better outcomes, better patient outcome, both in terms of earlier detection, earlier treatment, and prevention of, of unfortunate sequelae of atrial fibrillation. So we prevent strokes, prevent hospitalizations, prevent death by detecting atrial fibrillation on an earlier basis. Again, these devices can uh, ch check the ECG. They can also uh, have other capabilities depending on the device. They can detect other um, areas of, car of concern to the, to the patient. Uh, and they come in forms of wristwatches, smartphones, patches. There's even eye bands, eyeglasses, and necklaces that are being um, researched uh, for, the, for such uh, detection uh, devices. So it's great for, uh, from a physician point of view that our patients now know more about their diseases than we do oftentimes. And it's not unusual for a patient to come to one of my offices or any of our cardio, uh, capital health medical group offices and let us know when their atrial fibrillation occurred. They actually show us on their smartphones or on their um, iPhones uh, or in their cardio mobile apps where their, their AFib EKGs, which have a timestamp, a date, a time, a duration. It's, it's really fantastic technology. Atrial fibrillation, now, we have, now with these better uh, and earlier detection devices, uh, is rapidly um, becoming a very common arrhythmia. It, we already knew it was common, but it's becoming even more common than we even thought because m many asymptomatic or minimally symptomatic patients are now finding out that they have AFib as well. Uh, it's estimated that about 34 million people in the, United, in the world have atrial fibrillation. One in four people over the age of 55 will develop atrial fibrillation. And the incidence increases with age doubling every decade after the age of 55. When you look at the United States data, uh, and, and my, which mirrors the, you know, the worldwide data, atrial fibrillation is very common among patients 60 years old or over. Although it is seen at all ages, as you can see in the bottom screen, uh, bottom graph, at age, starting around age 60, exponentially grow, in, grows in incidence. And by the time someone is in their 80s, there's about an 8% incidence of atrial fibrillation in people in their 80s. Roughly one in 12 people will have atrial fibrillation at 80 years old. Um, some of the newer data, as they project out towards the future, by the year 2030, as many as 12 million Americans will have atrial fibrillation. By the year 1250, 2050, excuse me, nearly 16 million people in the United States are estimated to have atrial fibrillation. So this is a growing epidemic uh, in the United States and the world, uh, atrial fibrillation, and very much mirrors the aging of the population. As people grow older and live longer, atrial fibrillation becomes a bigger and bigger issue. As the, uh, the United States uh, Centers for Disease Control actually um, has shown in a map, density map, the incidence of dysrhythmias in the United States, the majority of these dysrhythmias are atrial fibrillation. And as you can see, based on the dark red and brown colors, that where we reside in central New Jersey and eastern Pennsylvania, atrial fibrillation is a very, very common arrhythmia compared to much of the rest of the country. We have a very high incidence of atrial fibrillation, which unfortunately also matches the incidence of stroke uh, in the United States. And so this is where I want to segue. This atrial fibrillation, if, if nothing else, is a major risk factor for stroke. It is the most common re, uh, risk, is the most common in, uh, cause of stroke in the United States. People with atrial fibrillation have five times greater risk of stroke than people who don't have atrial fibrillation. And the mechanism of stroke in people with atrial fibrillation is a blood clot which initiates in the heart, in the atrium, where the atrium is fibrillating, and the blood clot then forms, dislodges, and embolizes through the heart chambers, up the aorta, which is the main artery from the heart, through the, the brain circulation to lodge up into the upper brain and cause ischemic event, which is otherwise known as an infarction and death to brain tissue from starvation of blood supply. We know that from many scientific studies over the past few decades that there are risk factors for stroke in people with atrial fibrillation. Not all atrial fibrillation patients are the same. And, there, and those patients who have these risk factors 
in addition to their atrial fibrillation may be at or are at increased risk for having a stroke. And those risk factors include congestive heart failure, hypertension, age over 65, and especially age over 75, diabetes, previous stroke or mini strokes, vascular disease, either in the form of coronary artery disease, aortic disease, or peripheral artery disease, or being a female, um, perhaps estrogen effects, can all re uh, co uh, compound with atrial fibrillation to increase one's risk for stroke. And based on that scoring system, we often decide as physicians whether patients require blood thinners or other forms of treatment to prevent strokes. The mechanism of stroke, again, is, as I'm showing here in the bottom uh, diagram, this little outpouching of the left upper chamber called the left atrial appendage is where most blood clots, over 90% of blood clots will form in people with atrial fibrillation. And then the blood clot then dis dislodges and can embolize through the circulatory system to the brain. This is on the upper left cor uh, uh, photo, uh, an actual picture of a left of a transesophageal echocardiogram of someone's left atrium, as shown here in this large black area on the top, and their left atrial appendage is going down towards six o'clock. And inside that left atrial appendage, which is supposed to be black, filled with blood, as, as is the left atrial chamber, you'll see a big, large white substance. That white substance is thrombus or clot. Uh, on the lower right, you'll see a, a different uh, patient who, uh, uh, who expired. And when they opened up the, the patient's heart during autopsy, they found the uh, evidence of thrombus in someone who had a history of atrial fibrillation. So clot is the enemy in patients with atrial fibrillation. Can, traditionally, the treatment for prevention of strokes in people with atrial fibrillation was Coumadin or Warfarin, to, um, which requires blood testing to regulate the level of blood thinner in a particular patient and decide which of these milligram strength uh, of Coumadin the patient should be taking. And that, that number unfortunately changes from time to time. It can be very diet related. Uh, and so um, certain dietary restrictions are applied to these patients and they often have to get blood tests. Uh, today we have more, uh, uh, we have newer uh, blood thinners which are indicated and approved for the use in patients with atrial fibrillation to prevent stroke, Pradaxa, Xarelto, Eliquis, and Savesa. These are, medicines all have in common the lack of need for blood tests. So they do, you do not need a blood test for these medications. It's basically one size fits all, uh, depending on one's renal function um, and maybe a few other factors. Uh, we essentially give the same milligram strength or one of two milligram strengths to all patients. To prevent this blood, the idea is to prevent this blood clot from causing a stroke in the brain. Now there are patients who choose to or may not want to be on a blood thinner. And we today, we, um, I'm happy to also report that the, our division of cardiac electrophysiology will have the ability at Capital Health uh, Regional Medical Center to insert and plant a transvenous device called the Watchman. It is a left atrial appendage occluder device where we using a catheter technology through a blood vessel in the in a blood vein in the leg, we can advance this sheath system up through the ve venous system to the left atrial appendage and deploy a filter-like device which will close off the left atrial appendage and prevent any blood clots from that may form in the future from traveling outside the left atrial appendage and embolizing to the brain. These studies have shown that this technology is as good as taking a blood thinner with less risk of bleeding long-term, which is suggesting improved safety. Again, it's indicated for people who already need a blood thinner. They have a high enough CHADS2 VASC score to require a blood thinner, but they don't either can't tolerate a blood thinner or prefer not to be on a blood thinner long-term. And this is what the watchman looks like after six weeks uh, of therapy, the, the heart lining, otherwise known as the endothelium, will often cover the, the filter so that basically the heart heals over the watchman. And, 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 and um, at that point, after six weeks, uh, blood thinners can often be reduced. And long after six months later, uh, we often uh, stop blood thinners completely and just have a patient on a baby aspirin only. 
Success, uh, co the complication and success rate with a Watchman procedure not over 90, approximately 95% in clinical trials. Uh, I will say with more recent clinical trials, closer to 98%. Success rate with implantation, meaning uh, we're able to deploy the Watchman and size and fit it to that certain to an individual patient's left atrial fibrillation uh, without significant uh, risk, less than 1% risk. And it seems to perform just as well as warfarin and the novel anticoagulants in preventing strokes uh, across all CHADS 2 vast scores. So again, stroke prevention is of paramount, perform, uh, paramount importance in people with atrial fibrillation, whether one takes a blood thinner pill or one has a Watchman left atrial appendage occluder. In addition, atrial fibrillation can also affect one's quality of life. So in addition to stroke prevention, quality of life is also of paramount importance with people with atrial fibrillation. Atrial fibrillation can cause multiple symptoms, ranging from breathlessness, dizziness, feeling like your heart is running when you're standing still, palpitations, tiredness, chest discomfort, or just weakness and difficulty exercising. Most patients will complain of one or more of uh, these different symptoms in atrial fibrillation. So in many patients, this is a big problem. It actually limits one's quality of life. <clears throat> and we know from studies that the initiators in atrial fibrillation appear to occur in the back wall of the left upper chamber, not too far away from where the pulmonary veins, which are these little round pink structures, insert into the left, the back wall, the posterior wall, the left upper chamber. And these, inside these little pulmonary veins are muscular sleeves from, that extend from the heart and create little electrical stimulation or, or sparks, which can travel through the pulmonary veins into the main chamber of the left atrium and initiate short circuits, which can later become atrial fibrillation. These initial studies were done in 1998 in, in Bordeaux, France, but have been replicated in the United States and other countries around the world. And we now know that the vast majority, approximately 90% of atrial fibrillation initiates in and around these pulmonary veins. So our target when we, when we bring people to Capital Health Regional Medical Center cardiac electrophysiology laboratories is to uh, ablate these areas and to prevent atrial fibrillation in patients who are uh, symptomatic. We do not do ablations for people who are asymptomatic. This is to improve one's quality of life. This does not prevent stroke. This does not necessarily negate someone from having to take a blood thinner or getting a watchman. This is to improve symptoms and improve quality of life. So the idea here is that we prevent these little micro circuits that have hugged the uh, pulmonary veins with our catheter. And the catheter is again advanced through the venous system and, for, and advanced across the left, the right to the left upper chamber of the heart where we can both map and ablate in a circular fashion around these four pulmonary vein uh, entrances into the heart. And in, in our laboratory, we have multiple screens. We're looking at multiple, it's a multimedia pr production. We have x-ray equipment. We have 3D mapping systems. We have electrical recordings, both outside and inside the heart. And we have intracardiac and, out, and transesophageal echocardiography so that we see and, and, and can direct our treatment with, uh, with the highest safety and efficacy. Um, our, our, and for patients who have Early atrial fibrillation, we often just encircle the pulmonary veins and, and, and isolate the muscular sleeves from preventing sparks from getting out to the rest of the heart, as shown in the upper diagram. For those patients who have more longstanding atrial fibrillation, we often sometimes will uh, uh, encircle each individual vein uh, separately, as well as the posterior or, or middle chamber between the two circles with a roof and a floor line to, to box off, if you will, the back wall, the entire back wall of the left upper chamber, which interestingly embryologically is formed by the same tissue that the pulmonary veins themselves are formed by. And so, and for people who have longstanding atrial fibrillation, many of those circuits that start in the pulmonary veins can, invest, and it can eventually form in the uh, posterior wall area, which is embryologically a similar tissue, which is why we do a little more extensive ablation for those patients. Here's an example of some recent maps of some recent patients that were ablated at Capital Health Regional Medical Center. I will, I will tell you that these are uh, the, you're looking at the back wall, the left upper chamber. 
um, in, a, in a patient that's facing away from you. So the, if you can see the head on the top is back, there's no face, you're looking at the back of his head. And in the back wall of the left upper chamber, the colors represent voltages. Purple is normal voltages, meaning normal electrical uh, signals. Red is lack of voltages. And then you can, I think you can appreciate that in all four pulmonary veins, some more, some less, there is active electrical activity in all four pulmonary veins, pre-ablation. We then lay our lesion set outside the pulmonary veins. We, we take great care not to ablate the veins themselves for fear of damaging the veins. And after the ablation, those areas that were previously purple are now red. We have, iso we have electrically isolated those areas. There is no more electricity in coming from the sleeves around the pulmonary veins. And we know that from clinical studies, that is what's required as a minimum for afib ablation. For someone who has more long-standing atrial fibrillation, I think you can, in this example, there's more disease and fibrosis and low voltages in both the posterior wall as well as around each of the pulmonary veins, which also have activity in purple colors in each of the veins as well. And in these, in this patient, in these patient population patients with longer standing AFib, we will ablate around each of the pulmonary veins as well as box off the posterior wall in addition to isolating the pulmonary veins so as to create, as you can see in these two examples, pre and post, complete isolation of all four pulmonary veins and the intervening posterior wall in between, okay? And we know from studies, many good large randomized prospective controlled trials that with recent technology that up to 88% of patients who come to AFib ablation will be um, uh, essentially cured. I hate using that word cured, but uh, they made rid of their atrial fibrillation and will maintain normal sinus rhythm in for long term in long term follow up. This has been um, validated in the most recent Cabana randomized clinical trial, which was the largest randomized control trial to date. It was an international study based out of the Mayo Clinic, involved many countries and most continents around the world, published in 19, 20, excuse me, 2019 and basically showed that in, in the primary outcome, in addition to efficacy, in addition to the fact that a, a ablation was superior to antiarrhythmic drug therapy in preventing atrial fibrillation recurrence, which was known in previous studies, it also found that in those patients who received the treatment that were, they were randomized to, either ablation or antiarrhythmic drugs, most of them were amiodarone, um, some sotalol uh, that death, disabling stroke, serious bleeding, or cardiac arrest was, as a combined endpoint was significantly reduced by a, a two-thirds margin to, uh, compared to the drug therapy. Um, and also that there was a signal towards improved mortality in de death or cardiovascular hospitalization in patients who got atrial fibrillation ablation. So in summary, atrial fibrillation remains a public health issue. There's an increasing population at risk. It's associated with diminished quality of life, <clears throat> as well as um, increased risk for stroke. Uh, stroke prevention is of paramount importance with people with atrial fibrillation. Uh, and in patients who have CHADS, uh, elevated CHADS to VASC scores, they should be considered uh, for either warfarin, Prodaxa, Xarelto, Eliquis, or Cervasa therapy. Those are oral anticoagulants. Uh, or for those patients who prefer not to be on long-term anticoagulation or cannot tolerate long-term anticoagulation due to either an elevated bleeding risk or perhaps falling risk and injury, uh, or they're in a high-risk occupation that may um, lead to trauma and or uh, bleeding, um, the Watchman left atrial appendage occluded device is a, is a very good option for, other, for those patients with e essentially equal efficacy compared to the oral anticoagulation and perhaps better safety in terms of reduced long-term bleeding risk. And catheter-based ablation um, has been proven now to prevent atrial fibrillation recurrence uh, compared to uh, medical therapy and also may also improve uh, um, long-term strokes and, and or death from stroke from in terms of reducing AFib burden um, in those patients who actually get the treatment. And with that, I open up the floor to questions for either myself or Dr. Desai. Thank you very much. And I hope this talk was uh, illuminating. Uh, I hope I only bored you for a minute. And I look forward uh, to the questions and uh, know that we here at the cardiac uh, electrophysiology section of Capital Health Medical Group 
uh, are here to help uh, uh, serve you and uh, at any time. We have offices in Newtown, uh, Pennsylvania, Lawrenceville, New Jersey, and Robbinsville, New Jersey. Thank you very much. Thank you both. They were both very interesting. Again, I'd like to invite people to either ask their questions, take their phones off mute and ask the question, or you can type it into the chat box. Um, if I can kick off, I'll kick off with one question. Um, why is it more prevalent for AFib to, to occur as people age? What's happening in the body that makes it more common? Well, that's an excellent question. And of course, there's probably multiple reasons. Um, we know from studies, a lot, some of which are uh, cardiac MRI studies um, in patients who are living, since we can't take their hearts out of their body, that, that fibrosis, which is a medical word for scarring, occurs in the left atrium. And it seems that as we get older, there's more fibrosis, and that may lead to um, irregular electrical signals in the, at the cellular level, which can then promote atrial fibrillation. Th that seems to be the reason, um, but it, it's hard to know. There may be other issues. Hypertension can also lead to cardiac fibrosis. Congestive heart failure and valvular heart disease can lead to left atrial stretching and eventual um, uh, st uh, sparks and, and short circuits from the stretching of the, of the, of the electrical firing of the cells. <clears throat> so for all the above reasons and probably others, uh, we know for sure that atrial fibrillation is a disease that's more often seen in older people over the age of 60, but not exclusively. And we certain, there are genetic, there are some genetic um, mutations which have been found to predispose to atrial fibrillation in certain families. And then those people, we can see it in, in, in their early 20s or 30s, but commonly 60 or above. Terrific. Um, and a follow-up question to that is, um, it seems that a lot of people don't realize that they're in AFib when they're in AFib. Are there specific signs that they should look for? That's an excellent question too, because those are I mean, the ones that worry me the most. The ones who have symptoms, they know to come get medical attention. We get them the blood thinners, we prevent strokes. We can get them the, the med other medications to alleviate their symptoms, maybe refer them to an ablation one day. And the what are those who, symptoms? Well, as I mentioned in my talk, it can range from dizziness, lightheadedness, fatigue, shortness of breath, uh, palpitations, or some combination of the above. Uh, there are some patients who uh, are so debilitated they can't even get out of bed in the morning. But there are, there are other patients, which I think you were alluding to, that don't even know they're in AFib. And those are a, a minority of patients. Uh, but those are the ones that worry me the most because those, those ones, they don't even know to get medical attention. And so if you're worried that you may be over 60 and you may be at risk for AFib, one of the things you could do is get one of those mobile EKG devices that I, I started my talk about. Uh, I don't want to promote any one company or any one product, uh, but they're com all commercially available. There are many of them are FDA approved as medical grade devices, and you can check your EKG every day and with very high, um, um, you know, high accuracy. And if the atrial fibrillation is detected by the device, that would be, you know, and you didn't feel anything, but you, it's, the device shows it, you would want to speak to your primary doctor and get to your medical attention before anything bad happens. Okay, great. And someone um, sent me a question for Dr. Desai. Um, you talked about the, the risk factors and the scoring. Um, so if someone sees that they have a lot of those risk factors, should they contact their primary doctor or go immediately to a cardiologist because they have a lot of the risk factors and say for follow-up and diagnosis? Can you hear me? Yes, I can. Yes, the question is uh, someone with multiple cardiac risk factors, where should they seek initial care? Correct. I would definitely start with a primary care physician, get an EKG, and then uh, describe their symptoms, if they have any, in addition to the risk factors for primary care. And then if the primary care uh, physician uh, deems appropriate, they will consult as uh, cardiology or send us for evaluation. So bottom line is start with primary care doctors. Terrific. We have a question in the chat box. Would a patient in their mid seventies who is diagnosed with AFib for more than 20 years, who now seems to have balance issues and recent falls, 
Would the Watchman procedure be a possibility for this type of patient to come off of blood thinners? Absolutely. That's an excellent question. Um, those are the kind of patients that often come to us for the Watchman. Uh, someone who is doing well, has an established diagnosis of atrial fibrillation, but for whatever reason, they don't want to be on a long-term blood thinner. And a, a common scenario is someone who is a, has some imbalance, increased risk for falling, and is very concerned that if they fall and hit their head or, or, or traumatize other parts of their body, and they're going to have a big bleed and that we, on the blood thinner. And those are the type of patients that we actually do offer the Watchman left atrial appendage occluder for. And um, I will tell you that uh, we don't stop the blood thinner immediately after the Watchman is installed. We wait for that endothelial lining to heal over the Watchman, which roughly takes about 42 days or six weeks. So um, I, I want the, pa the patients need to know that they're, they're, they need to stay on their blood thinner for a short term after the Watchman is implanted. But once we have that evidence that the, heart, the watchman is healed sufficiently, after about six weeks, we can start to reduce the blood thinners and remove the, um, blood, uh, ultimately remove the blood thinner completely.